let f from x to y be a function. We say that f is injective or one to one, or f is an injection, if for all elements x one and x two in x, x one is not equal to x two implies that f of x one is not equal to f of x two. Equivalently, we can consider the contrapositive statement, which is that for all elements x one and x two in x, f of x one equals f of x two implies that x one equals x two. This means that f is injective, if different inputs give different outputs, or equivalently, whenever the outputs are the same, the inputs also have to be the same. We say that f is subjective or onto, or that f is a subjection, if the image of f equals y. In other words, for all elements y in the set y, there exists an element x in the set x such that f of x equals y. This means that f is subjective when the image is equal to the range, or more precisely, whatever element y that you give me in the range, I can always find an element x in the domain such that x is mapped to y. If both one and two hold, in other words, f is both injective and subjective, we say that f is bijective, or that f is a bijection. Let's consider some examples. Let f be defined from the real numbers to itself by f of x equals x squared. Observe that one is not equal to negative one, but f of one equals f of negative one equals one. So this means that we have two different inputs which give the same output. So f is not injective. Also, for all elements x in the reals. F of x is not equal to negative one. This implies that negative one is not in the image of f, so f is not subjective. Secondly, let's define f from the non-negative real numbers to the real numbers by f of x equals x squared. This means that we have restricted the domain in the first example. Now, f of x one equals f of x two implies that x one squared. Equals x two squared, which implies that x one equals x two, since both x one and x two are non-negative. So f is injective, but f is not subjective, because again, negative one is not in the image of f. For the third example, let's define f from the real numbers to the non-negative real numbers by f of x equals x squared. That is. We restrict the range of the function in the first example. Note that f is not injective, because again one and negative one are both mapped to one. However, for all elements y in the non-negative real numbers, y is equal to the square of the square root of y, which is equal to f of the square root of y, which is in the image of f. So f is subjective. As the last example. Let's define f from the non-negative real numbers to itself by f of x equals x squared. In other words, we have restricted both the domain and the range in the first example. Using the above arguments, we see that f is both injective and subjective, so f is bijective. Let's look at the following proposition. Let x and y be finite sets. And f from x to y be a function. If f is injective, then the size of x is less than or equal to the size of y. If f is subjective, then the size of x is greater than or equal to the size of y. If f is bijective, then the size of x equals the size of y. To simplify our notation, let the size of x be m and the size of y be n. For the first point. We list the elements of x as x one, x two, up to x m. F is injective implies that f of x one, f of x two, up to f of x m are distinct elements in Y. This means that Y must contain at least m elements. In other words, m is less than or equal to n. For the second point, we write the elements of Y as Y one, Y two. Up to y n, f is surjective 
implies that there exist elements x1, x2, up to xn in x, such that f of x1 equals y1, f of x2 equals y2, and so on until f of xn equals yn. This implies that the set x contains the elements x1, x2, up to xn. So the size of x, which is m, is greater than or equal to n. For the third point, f is bijective implies that f is injective and surjective. So using the first two points, we have that m is less than or equal to n, and m is greater than or equal to n. So we must have m is equal to n, and this completes the proof. Let x, y, and z be sets. Let f from x to y and g from y to z be functions. The composition g composed f is the function from x to z defined by g composed f of x equals g of f of x for all elements x in x. That means that we first apply f to x and then apply g. Notice that for a composition of two functions to be defined, it must be the case that the range of f equals the domain of g. Let's look at some examples. Let's define f from the real numbers to itself by f of x equals cos of x, and g from the real numbers to itself by g of x equals 2x plus 1. Then g composed f is a function from the real numbers to itself defined by g composed f of x equals g of f of x, which equals g of cos of x, which is 2 times cos of x plus 1. On the other hand, we can also form f composed g, which is a function from the real numbers to itself defined by f composed g of x equals f of g of x, which equals f of 2x plus 1, which equals cos of 2x plus 1. As a second example, let f be the function from the set 1, 2, and 3 to the set of natural numbers defined by 1 is mapped to 7, 2 is mapped to 6, and 3 is mapped to 4. g is a function defined from the set of natural numbers to the set of rational numbers, where g of x equals 1 over x. Then, the composition g composed f is a function from the set 1, 2, and 3 to the set of rational numbers, defined by 1 is mapped to 1 over 7, 2 is mapped to 1 over 6, and 3 is mapped to 1 over 4. Notice that f composed g does not exist since the range of g is not equal to the domain of f. More precisely, in order to define f composed g, I need to know the values of f at all values of g. But the values of g are rational numbers on which f is not defined, since f is only defined on the numbers 1, 2, and 3. So f composed g does not exist. Let f from x to y be a function. We say that f is invertible if there exists a function g from y to x such that g of f of x equals x for all elements x in x and f of g of y equals y for all elements y in y. In other words, g composed f is the identity function on x, and f composed g is the identity function on y. In this case, g is called the inverse of f, denoted by f superscript negative 1. Let's look at more examples. Let f from the real numbers to itself defined by f of x equals x squared, and g from the non-negative real numbers to the real numbers, defined by g of y equals square root of y. Observe that f composed g is not equal to the identity function on the non-negative real numbers, since f composed g is a function from the non-negative real numbers to the real numbers. So the range of f composed g is not equal to the non-negative real numbers. On the other hand, g composed f does not exist since the range of f is not equal to the domain of g. This implies that f is not invertible. 
As a second example, we restrict the range of f to the set of non-negative real numbers, and keep g the same. Then, f composed g is a function from the non-negative real numbers to itself, and f composed g of y equals the square of square root of y, which equals y. So f composed g is the identity function on the non-negative real numbers. Also, g composed f is a function from the real numbers to itself, defined by g composed f of x equals the square root of x squared, which equals the absolute value of x, which is not equal to x if x is negative. So g composed f is not the identity function on the real numbers, and f is not invertible. As a third example, we also restrict the range of g to the non-negative real numbers. Now, f composed g is the identity function on the non-negative real numbers, and g composed f is a function from the non-negative real numbers to itself, defined by g composed f of x equals the square root of x squared, which equals x, since x is non-negative. So g composed f is the identity function on the non-negative real numbers. So f is invertible with inverse g. We end this video by the following proposition. A function f from x to y is invertible if and only if f is bijective. Let's first prove the only if direction. Let g be the inverse of f. Now, f of x1 equals f of x2 implies that we can apply g to both sides to get g of f of x1 equals g of f of x2. Since g composed f is the identity function, this implies that x1 equals x2, so f is injective. Also, let y be an element of the set y. Then, g of y is an element in x, and f of g of y equals y. So f is surjective. Conversely, let y be an element of the set y. Since f is surjective, there exists an element x in x, such that f of x equals y. We define a function g from y to x by g of y equals x. We need to check that g is well defined. In other words, if we have the same input y1 and y2, then the outputs g of y1 and g of y2 also have to be the same. So suppose y1 equals y2. Since f is subjective, there exist x1 and x2 in x, such that f of x1 equals y1 and f of x2 equals y2. So f of x1 equals f of x2, which implies that x1 equals x2, since f is subjective. Hence, g of y1 equals x1 equals x2 equals g of y2. Now, g of f of x equals g of y, which equals x, and f of g of y equals f of x, which equals y. Since x and y are arbitrary, we have that g is the inverse of f. And this completes the proof.